Welcome to the last day of class. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to. <laughs> Take a test once every month. It's fun. I, I like mine. Do you like yours? Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, as soon as that, several announcements posted on Canvas or via email over the last couple of days um, regarding regrades, preparation for the final um, review session that has been moved from 4 o'clock to 3 30 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, if any of that, if you missed any of that, go back through your inbox and through the Canvas announcements to find it. Um, if you have any questions or things are unclear about what you need to do for that, please let me know. The topics list for the final exam is up. Everything you need to know, the different experiments you need to understand um, are all posted. And you also should review the slides that are posted from the last unit and this unit and make sure you understand what's going on and the main point or points of every slide that we went through um, for the last couple of weeks. And the experiments, the logic behind them and so on. Any questions about the final exam coming up in a couple of days on Tuesday? Tuesday. Yeah. I'm good. Yes. Um, yeah, so I know there's not going to be any practice problems for this right. unit, but um, can you give us like, a couple of examples of what, of what a question about these topics might well, be like? Well, yeah, so I mean, so what, I, I, what, what an example of a question would be like, explain to me the, the, the experiments that led to the old model of Exeter. And the old model. Explain the new experiments and why they led to a new model, and explain why the new model also counts for the old experiments. Um, explain, or I could say, so imagine that there is some other sort of differentiation that's going on, and you think the signal does this. Um, consider another possibility where there might be some negative regulation. How would you distinguish between those two possibilities? So, how do you like separate the cell disease from the system local social signal? Um, for this unit, um, some of the stuff that so, you, know, you might have, uh, think, like uh, some of the stuff we'll talk about today is, why do they put in GTP in certain situations? Even when they're looking at the beta gamma subunit, why is GTP sometimes needed and sometimes not? Um, so a lot of stuff from today, we'll sort of work through some data today, and you'll have to work through the same kinds of data on the exam. So the, the, the in-class activities from today are actually gonna be good practice for the exam. Um, I'll also, um, like I said in the announcement that I posted, one of the recent ones I posted on Canvas, um, there are research articles posted up on Canvas. There's one that was written by David Clapham that I don't have any figures from for this, but I am going to be taking figures out of that for the final exam. That does not mean you need to know the entire research paper, but if I show you a, 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 a graph from that paper where they've applied beta gamma subunits, um, you should be able to explain to me that the, whether or not the channel's open and what that means. If I ask you why they use something which we're talking about today called recombinant beta gamma subunits as opposed to purifying it from the heart, you should explain to me why that in this case is a better method. You should also be thinking about the limitations of recombinant beta gamma subunits, which is something else that we'll touch on today. Um, and so, yeah, so as you're working, as you're sort of preparing, um, you don't need to understand all of the technical details of how they make recombinant beta gamma and all of the sort of genetic wizardry that goes into that, um, but why it's a better source, um, at least in this situation. Um, and, um, and also, you know, like what happens when you add alpha with GDP associated with it? That's gonna, we'll see that that's going to stop the current from flowing. Why does that stop the current from flowing? It's something we'll do today. we we'll have to work through again on the exam. So you see very similar figures to what's, uh, what things we're going to talk about today on the exam, and you have to explain them. And the ex the, 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 it's, it's, it's going to be basically the same experiments, just presented in a slightly different order on the exam. You'll have to explain, but they'll have the same basic explanations. Does that help a little bit with that? No. Okay. Yeah. And this is all being recorded, so you can go rewatch that next. There's the last few minutes over and over again. So I you want to like to see all the examples. Other questions about things to be about? Yeah. Question yes. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so I know that there's a lot of different times. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<coughs> uh, my hope is that there will be very little time pressure on the exam, uh, on the final exam. Um, so yeah, um, like I said, in the, in one other thing, like I said on one of the announcements, um, it's not going to be completely comprehensive, but it will go into depth on a few topics. Um, not necessarily the same topics that I went into a lot of depth in on major two and major three. Um, so, yeah. yeah, other questions about Okay, so um, so we're trying to answer this question here, um, and I've mostly sort of indicated already by now, you've got a sense of what the final results can be. We're trying to understand sort of how we get there in terms of um, uh, acetylcholine signaling in the heart. And in particular, um, so the G, after the acetylcholine receptor is activated, um, we'll draw this over here for us here. So we've got, here's our membrane. Here's our acetylcholine receptor. Um, acetylcholine binds to it. And then inside, my colors consistent with what I've got. Um, we've got our alpha I uh, G protein subunit. And then um, our beta gamma subunits, which come as a pair and they never come apart from each other. And once the G protein binds, then um, the GDP that was associated with this floats away. A fresh GTP comes in and attaches to this. And then the alpha subunit and the beta and gamma subunits break apart from each other. Um, prior to the late 80s and early 90s, people thought that beta and gamma subunits only purpose was to prevent the alpha subunit from attaching to things that, so the alpha does all the work and the betas and gammas exist to prevent the alpha from activating something at the wrong time. But a few people were starting to ask, well, why do we even need the beta and gamma subunits when the GTP is also doing that job? Um, the alpha is only able to bind, uh, in the case of adrenaline, the alpha is only able to bind and activate adenylocyclase and turn on that whole sequence of events when GTP is bound to it. Um, and the idea that Lutz Birnbarmer had for, um, for um, uh, acetylcholine was that the alpha subunit only binds to the potassium channel and opens it and lets potassium flow across the membrane um, once GTP is bound. Um, and so it seems like the beta gamma subunits are a little bit redundant. And David Clapham started thinking, well, maybe those beta gamma subunits have more to do than just sort of keeping the alpha regulated. Maybe sometimes they're doing some important work too. Um, and so, uh, and so, what he did, his experiment. Oops, I didn't put this in. So it's like, this slide's um, his experiment, David Clapham's, was to um, purify the beta and gamma subunits from the heart, and then. Um, when he did that, and he um, had this isolated patch of membrane, where remember, so this is what it used to look like when it was attached to the cell, then you rip this patch of membrane away from the cell, so all you've got left is this patch, and then inside your tube of glass corresponds to what used to be the outside of the cell, and outside in the solution is what used to be the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. And so if he sticks some free beta gamma with no alphas to get in their way um, onto the inside surface of the cell membrane, then what he sees is current begins to flow across these receptors. And that even persists for a little while after the beta gamma leaves, his interpretation of that being that the beta gamma stays stuck. Actually, so I should say that wrong. Um, the beta gamma stays stuck for a little while, and so even after you get rid of the beta gamma from the broader solution, a few are stuck to those channels. Um, but the main idea is that the purified beta and gamma subunits activate this channel. Um, Lutz Bernbrommer wrote this yelling, screaming article about it, and then also did some experiments where he took alpha subunits that had GTP associated with them, um, and in his case, increasing concentrations of, a, of the alpha <coughs> subunits led to increasing amount of current flowing across these receptors. Um, and so these are, this is again different from the ectoderm, where actually in this case we're not going to have a, a sort of theoretical shift that lets us rethink everything and explain everything, but rather we have two scientists that have both tried the same set of experiments, and in David Clapham's lab, the purified beta gamma opens the channel, 
purified alpha with GTP attached does not. In the sperm farmer's lab, purified alpha with GTP attached opens the channel. And again, it doesn't. Um, but we did. Actually, just let me pause there for a second. What questions do people have about that so far? Yes. Yeah, sure. So in the second experiment, he did test just the alpha and it did see it, right? He did, yeah. In this one, yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and there's not really, so, so I mean, sort of, you know, now, now the modern idea is that beta and gamma subunits um, are, the, are the thing that actually do the work. Nobody has a great explanation for why when Lutz Bombarmer did the beta and gamma subunits, he wasn't able to get currents. Um, although proteins are a little bit finicky, and sometimes you can accidentally sort of damage proteins when you don't mean to. And so, it's, and so um, uh, there, there, there are plenty of ways to have a sort of honest mistake in the lab that leads to a negative result um, in that sense. Um, yeah? Um, what is the function of beta gamma? Uh, so, to open the potassium channels. Yes. That sort of, <laughs> uh, in this case, in the, in the uh, acetylcholine receptors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get to, we'll kind, of, we'll kind of work through that a little bit more. Um, um, sort of uh, get to how, we, so I'm much more interested, so with this, um, you know, on the one hand, so on Monday, right, I said to you all, we're going to figure out how the potassium channels are. And the answer to that question is either the alpha subunits bind once GTP is there, or once GTP binds to the alpha subunits, they let go of the beta gamma, and then the beta gamma go and bind it over there. Um, that is literally like the smallest amount of information, one bit of information, to answer that question. And yet we're spending three class periods on it. Um, and part of the reason is that um, in this unit, in this last two weeks, um, the, the focus is not so much on learning a biological fact or two, um, but seeing the, bi the, the process of biological experiments and interpreting the results, seeing the limitations of some experiments, whether those limitations are because you don't know all of the signaling molecules, like we had in the ectoderm unit, or in this case, technical limitations where there are some impurities present in your solutions, um, or some, some imperfect purification um, that, that's going on. Um, and so to think about science as a process is really the goal here. And so, you know, the answer that it happens to be the beta gamma is like the least interesting part of all of this to me. The much more interesting part is how we figured that out. <coughs> and that's what the, the exam is going to be mostly asking you about as well. Um, does that make sense? So, so is, are there like further experiments that we're going to talk about? Yes. Like, we need to have yes. That figured out? How we're going to solve this with more experiments. <coughs> yes. So here we go. Okay. So, you know, they yelled at each other a lot, a lot of criticism, but out of that criticism came this idea, this, 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 this point that when you start with ground up heart tissue and try to purify proteins out of that, any purification method you use is going to be imperfect. So if you're trying to purify the alpha subunit, you can get rid of some of these other proteins that are present, get rid of a lot of the beta and gamma proteins that are present. But no matter how good you are in the lab, if there's um, no purification method is 100% perfect. And so there will be a few beta and gamma subunits still floating around. And also a few other proteins from, from the heart tissue still floating around as well. Um, but um, this is a problem if you are wanting to say for sure that the alpha subunit's what's opening this, and you're applying a solution that's mostly alpha subunits but has some betas and gammas floating around too, those beta and gamma subunits might be opening the channel. That challenge is not a challenge that just Luke Spoonbrammer had them. So David Clapham also had, you know, he was trying to purify the beta and gamma subunits. Sorry, I raised one of those, but whatever. So he's trying to purify the beta and gamma subunits, get rid of some of the other stuff. Um, but there's going to be some alpha subunits floating around here as well. Um, and actually, um, in, in David Clapham's papers, he needed to add some GTP before things worked. So people, so he got especially criticized that like these trace amounts of alpha subunits might be what's really opening the channel. So in both of these experiments, 
we've got an imper the same imperfect method and the same potential for problem. Plus, yeah, sure. But well, wouldn't more atherosclerotins produce more current? So if they found like only a little bit of current was being produced because only like a trace amount of output. It depends. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how good your purification is. I ideally, yes, but depending on how sloppy you are, you could run into more or less trouble. Um, yeah, you could. So they both got results with like negative like, or they wasn't right. current. But if it's like an imperfect method where they're getting some of each. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know, especially yeah. since now we now we believe that it's really the beta and gamma subunit. Why, when Bruce Barma tried to purify the beta gamma subunit, nothing worked. Somehow, something in that day happened, the temperature was wrong or something, and all his proteins got the same. So that's the explanation. But this is also something else that comes up sometimes in science. It's like, you have not necessarily, you sort of have your best interpretation of the balance of your You have a question? Right. So we know that the alpha, it has to be added to the alpha beta subunit when they were doing the experiment. Did any of the scientists think that it could be more chemicals that they had that were impurity that could be affecting the protein? Or is that immediately ruled out? Um, not necessarily. So, no, it's not necessarily immediately ruled out. And there were actually a number of points that they argued about, including other possible impurities present in the samples that aren't just the alpha and beta and gamma. Um, we're sort of focusing on that because it helps us to sort of motivate the next experiment. Um, but in fact, yeah, there, there, there in, in, in any experiment, there's not just maybe there's not maybe just one kind of impurity. You might have to worry about multiple kinds of impurities. Um, and so, and that's and that's you know an important concept that, that hopefully you'll be able to think about. But um, but for this case, we're just sort of focusing on that one impurity uh, as a sort of test case. Yes. How did they realize that the problem was that the solutions were impure? Because, in a minute, actually we're going to talk about one other experiment first, but then when we talk about a different experiment um, that doesn't have these impurities, that's sort of when it's all the thing. So, yeah. We, we, the next, so so that's, that's a very good point, and raises a very good point, which is that, um, that you know, so when, 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 you're, when you're criticizing science, that's great. In criticisms of other people's science, like I said, is really critical for science to progress. Um, but Luther Birnbaumer had like eight different complaints about David Clapham's paper. And David Clapham had like six or eight different complaints about Luther Birnbaumer's paper. Um, it turns out that the, that the one that, that we now, in hindsight, think was critical were these impurities. Um, but, um, but, so first of all, in criticizing each other, they, they sort of force each other to up their game and make more rigorous scientific experiments. Um, but second of all, sometimes you don't always know what's the problem at the time when weird results come in. And it takes more data to actually solve a problem. Criticizing takes thought and is by no means easy. Um, but it is a lot easier than doing an experiment that generates new definitive data, um, which is what ultimately is necessary to solve one of these scientific But before we get to that, um, I want to talk about one other experiment, um, which is, okay, so in this experiment, in this, um, what they had, is a, a patch of membrane, just like we had before, with um, an acetylcholine receptor, some acetylcholine. In the solution here, remember this is what used to be the outside of the cell, this is what used to be the inside of the cell. Um, and then they apply, at first, no GTP. So there's acetylcholine, but no GTP, um, and there's no current flowing. Then they add GTP and current starts to flow. Then they take away the GTP and current stops flowing. So the question is, um, does this experiment just by itself lend more weight to the idea that the alpha subunit is involved? Or does it lend more weight to the idea that the beta gamma subunit is involved? Or another way to say that is, if you're Lutz burn bomber and you think the alpha subunit is what binds to the potassium channel and opens it, how do you explain these, this experiment? That's it. 
first part. And the second part is, if you're David Clapham and you think it's a beta gamma subunit, how, why do you think that this still fits with your model? So Bern Balmer's idea is that it's the alpha subunit. Um, uh, Clapham's idea is that it's the beta and gamma subunits. And so the question is, how, how do each of them sort of reconcile this particular experiment with this? What do they think each of them think is going on at a molecular level when you add GTP when there's already acetylcholine floating around on what used to be the outside of the cell? So let's take three to five minutes and try to figure out um, if this uh, sort of fits better with either model, and then um, if you are Lutz Birnbaumer or David Clapham and you have these different ideas, how are you going to explain this experiment um, in the context of these two different people? Yeah, sure. Um, does it ACH open the metastatic channel? ACH activates the G protein. And the G protein coupled receptor, which then activates the G protein. Yeah. And then it's either the alpha subunit or the beta gamma subunit to find it. That's it. There are other places where ACH is with sodium channels, but that's not going on here. Yeah. If I ask about adrenaline and adrenaline signaling the sodium channel, or adrenaline receptors in general, then the adjective is alpha. I'm about especially general sight waves. Um, I could make up a scenario where there's some new super designs that you've never heard of. And you try to figure out if the alpha is being very Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or you would tell me, I would either show you some data and you would explain it, or you would tell me an experiment and you would say what the data you would expect to get. Yeah. PJB. I'm going to do the grading about the class. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions. Am I there for the exam? Yeah. Okay. Um, and what else? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
somebody or you're his buddy and you think that the alpha um, uh, subunit is what's opening the channel, then first of all, we've got acetylcholine out here. Um, and then so the acetylcholine receptor, acetylcholine is going to bind the acetylcholine receptor and then something's going to happen to the natural alpha and beta gamma subunits. So what's going to happen to those when the acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine? Dan, what do you think what's going to happen? Yeah? Nobody raise their hand. I got bored. What happens to me? What happens to the seal pulling body? Alright, I'll take over. I'm going to say that it changes shape. It changes shape, yeah. There was a GDP bound. What happens to that? Gets released. Gets released, yeah. So alpha releases. And then the alpha. GDP, and fortunately for the alpha subunit, there's some fresh GTP around. So it grabs GTP, and then what happens? How does the channel open? If you need to remember the idea? Yeah, so the alpha, alpha leaves. The alpha plus GTP leaves behind the beta gamma, and then the alpha binds and opens the channel. Okay, perfect, cool. So, yeah, so that's Luther Barber's explanation for this result. What about David Clapton? What does he think happens with this result? So, again, we have to start off the same way acetylcholine binds to the receptor. And then what happens with the natural occurring alpha being in sure, yeah. um, like the GDP gets released from the alpha, and then magically the GDP gets slapped onto it, which dissociates it from the beta gamma. And so the beta gamma are free to float around and bind to the receptor and like the magic power around. And then like, open the study channels. So yeah, it gets the GTP. GTP. And so now the alpha, which has been our problem that's preventing the beta and gamma from binding anything. So the alpha plus GTP floats away, but here's where David Clapham starts to disagree with Lutzburg and Barber. The alpha is not actually doing anything once it floats away. It's just getting out of the way. So the free, meaning that it hasn't, it's, it's, it's no longer attached to the alpha, beta gamma subunits bind and open passage. And so we see current. So this experiment doesn't really answer the debate, it just confirms for us that GTP and G proteins are involved. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So like, Clapham and Burma have opposite ideas? Yeah. I mean, like, well exactly. they agree about some things, right? They agree about what happens with GTP and the alpha subunit. It's just the question of once those, once the alpha with GTP and the beta and gamma separate from one another, Burn Bomber thinks the alpha does all the work and goes over and opens the channel. And it kind of thinks that in this case, unlike most of the other situations with the protein coupled receptors, the alpha just floats off and does nothing, and the beta and gamma go in front of the channel. He looks scared by that idea. Wait, so like, is it because of like the slow hydrolysis process of one alpha protein that it's like the time that the beta gamma can like do their thing? I don't know why this is. Yeah, um, biology is is 
magical. Unnecessarily complicated at some point, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, they did, the, the main experiment that David Clapton did was to try and purify the alpha and get rid of the beta gamma. But because the purification was imperfect, we now think that there was some beta gamma left behind in his purification, and that's why he saw a result when he stuck that on the channel. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, well, in this experiment, there, there was no purified anything going on. But in this experiment, he did add GCT, but there was, in this case, actually, this is what the iceberg gloss over the, the minus means there's no acetylcholine. And so in the absence of acetylcholine, the receptor doesn't get activated. And so you need to add external data if you have a subject. So, so when there's no acetylcholine, even if you add GTP, the the G protein, the, the alpha and beta gamma subunits that are already on the membrane um, don't get activated because there's no acetylcholine to turn them off. And so they stay the alpha subunit keeps the GDP, even though you, you swamp the system with GTP, the alpha subunit keeps the GDP because there has because the its receptor has a yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a very important point um, in the work. Yeah, it's, it's, I sort of glossed over this. The little minus sign that there's no acetylcholine, which is one difference between this and the other. Uh, did, that, did that turn off a little? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you say the Yeah, so it's important, in this case, and this is something else, it's important to sort of keep track of the alphas and betas and gammas that were already next to this membrane, and then the extra ones that you purified and added on. So in this experiment here, there's no extras that we've added on. But in this experiment, we add extra alpha with GTP on, um, or add extra beta and gamma that are just free-floating from uh, in the alpha. Um, and at the time, David Clapton thought this proved that the beta gamma was the active subunit. At the time, Lutz Baum, Bernbaum, thought that this proved that the alpha was what really bound to the channel. But what we now think happened is that Lutz Bernbaum's purification was not great. And so, yeah, but I'll get to like why, why we get there in just a second. Yeah. This one. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the bottom is the actual current where the channels like open and close, open and close, because the channels are just stay open forever. Um, and then the top graph is sort of a running average of how much resistance. Yeah, yeah. Um, what you're going to see is more like this, because that's more the data. Yeah. Um, in the, in the, on the exam, you're just going to see things that look like the bottom. Like, and like this as well, it's kind of like that bottom graph, where we're seeing the actual channel. And in a second, we'll see a few more of this. Yeah, yeah. So if the line is longer, that would increase it from a higher voltage, meaning more Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got the, but okay, so, so um, from here, we're still sort of left with this staring contest of somebody's purification was bad, but we're not sure whose. And so what you all came up with, and there were a lot of great ideas that people came up with on Wednesday about this, um, a lot of which circled around the idea of we need to have a system where our starting solution just has no alpha or no beta and gamma. So some people thought of removing the genes for alpha or beta gamma from an animal. Turns out the G proteins are so critical that that would kill the animal. But it's but but the idea is 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 great in, in that you're thinking along the exact right line. Um, in fact, what was done was to take advantage of the fact that bacteria do not have G proteins at all 
in their genus. And so if I have a bacterial cell, and I, um, through the magic of DNA technology, which you don't need to worry about, I create um, uh, a bacterial cell that expresses recombinant, which just means a new, in, in this case, we're combining bacterial DNA with mammalian DNA for the beta and gamma subunit, or mammalian DNA that codes for the alpha subunit. So it's kind of like recombination and crossing over where you get new combinations of DNA. Here in the lab, we're now making a new combination that has a hybrid of bacterial DNA and DNA that codes for the alpha subunit or DNA that codes for the beta and gamma subunits. So we have recombinant alpha. Um, so we have bacteria that express just the alpha subunit. And so that means that there's going to be a whole lot of bacterial proteins floating around once we grind our cells up. Um, and also, oh, I guess the color's a little simple here, but we'll work with it. Also some alpha, alpha I, um, proteins. But importantly, no beta and gamma proteins. So no matter how sloppy my purification is, there's no chance that there's any beta and gamma subunits coming along for the ride here. And then in a different experiment, we have bacteria that express recombinant beta and gamma subunits. And so what that means is that in our solution, again, we'll have some bacterial proteins. Um, running around. And also some beta and gamma proteins beta and gamma subunit proteins running around, but no alpha even in the starting situation. And a lot of people had some idea along this line of just having some starting material with no alpha or no beta and gamma in it. And then once we've got our starting material of bacteria that have whatever proteins they want as long as there's no betas and gammas, but they did make alpha for us, and then another batch of bacteria that have whatever bacteria proteins they want as long as there's no alpha G proteins in there and betas and gammas, now we can do a cleaner experiment. Um, and so this is what Lily Jan did uh, in 1994, about five years after this debate began. Um, is, uh, she engineered cloning is another word for this making bacteria as recombinant. It's, um, and so what she did is she took recombinant beta and gamma subunits here. So we've got bacteria made the beta and gamma subunits. There's no chance that there's any alpha proteins that came along to the ride because there were never any alpha proteins anywhere in these bacteria to begin with. And apply those to a patch of membrane, just like we've done before, apply it to the inside of a patch of membrane, and she sees lots of current flowing across the membrane. Um, she then, in a separate set of experiments, takes recombinant alpha sub i with GTP attached to it, and applies that to a membrane, and basically a flat line, no current flowing across the membrane. Um, and so, based on this, if we sort of say that Lily Jan's experiment was sort of like the, the, the final word, which as far as everyone's concerned it is, what, what do we think the answer is? Is it alpha or beta gamma that goes and opens a passage? Sort of beta gamma. Yeah, 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 cool. Okay, great, so that's fine, that's great. That's, that's um, and so, you know, one thing to take from this, is that improved technology, improved biotechnology, allows us to do cleaner experiments. You know, it's worth noting maybe that if some of these bacterial proteins were doing some damage, that could actually be a problem with this. So it's not necessarily always the best, but in this case, it at least solved that problem of potential alpha and beta gamma bacteria. Okay, then, just to sort of really established that the beta and gamma subunits are doing this. Lily Jan continued this experiment putting recombinant beta and gamma subunits onto a patch of membrane, onto the inside of what used to be inside of the cell of the patch of membrane. Um, and then, along with the beta and gamma subunits, added a whole crap ton of GTP, GDP, sorry, GDP. And adding a bunch of GDP didn't mess up the beta and gamma subunits' ability to keep that channel. Open. So that's one thing to think about. Then, for a couple minutes in there, she added recombinant alpha with GTP attached to it. And the current still flows across the membrane. 
<coughs> then she added recombinant alpha with GDP attached to it. And when she does that, then the current stops flowing across the middle. And so the questions for you to discuss for the next three minutes, four minutes, um, are first of all, what happens when we add the GDP? Then what happens when we add alpha that has GTP attached? And then finally, what happens when we add recombinant alpha with GDP? And how does all of this fit together with our final idea that the beta and gamma subunits are doing the work of opening the chain? <coughs>
channel is open, that by itself is sort of telling us pretty conclusively, unless there's something <coughs> weird about some of these bacterial proteins, that the beta and gamma subunit is what sticks to the channel and opens it. But we kind of want to nail it home and make sure it's not the alpha. Um, and so we add the GDP. One of the reasons for adding the GDP is because if, this, if there were any alphas involved, that GDP would stick to those alphas and stop the channel. Um, any, any alphas that we didn't get rid of, that GDP would stick to. But here, we add, some, just, we add just some random GDP here. The current doesn't change. Why not? Yeah? Because the GDP is not really going to do anything. It won't bind the beta gamma. Right. It won't bind the beta gamma. There's no alphas there for it to bind to. That makes sense? Then we come along and we add in some alpha with GDP on it. And so that doesn't do anything to our channel. Why not? Or G G I said the wrong thing. Alpha GTP. <laughs> Alpha GTP. Why does that not do anything? Yes. Because it has GTP that's still dissociated from the beta gamma. Right. So it's just going to float around and not interact with them. And it's not if off. it does bump into our beta gamma subunit, it's not in a shape where it's going to stick to the beta gamma subunit. Yeah. Then we get rid of that, and now we add alpha GDP. Now what happens to the current? What do we see in the data, first of all? Sure, yeah. So it's floating like a billion miles an hour, and so when it catches beta gamma, it like sticks to it and breaks it. Yeah, so it sticks to the beta gamma, so it stops. That's the interpretation. Actually, what happens to the current? Do we, if you look at the, so there's current, current, squiggly lines, squiggly lines, current, 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 and then all of a sudden here, what happens? Nothing. Nothing, no current, right, yeah. Our channel closes because now our alpha has grabbed hold of the beta gamma and pulled it away from the channel. Yeah, sure. How does the GDP alpha plus beta gamma return to the G protein called the receptor? It doesn't need to. It just needs to get the beta gamma off the channel. In like a normal situation. Um, again, things just move around until they bump into something that they stick to. And in that case, they're stuck to yeah. Are like they predisposed to like flow around near the edge of the membrane? They, they are attached to the membrane, actually, so they stay close to it, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Other questions about that? All right. So there's like two minutes left where I get to talk about some, some fun biology stuff. Like, biology is a Big themes from the class that I want to remind you of the last couple of minutes. Um, first of all, biology is a sloppy system. There's receptor tyrosine kinases that activate kinases that activate kinases that activate kinases. That activate kinases. It's this stupidly complicated process, and there's never really been a great explanation for why biology is such a big, sloppy process. But it's interesting to think about all of this going on in all of our cells all the time. Um, on the first day of class, I talked about how all cells come from other cells, and that means that every single cell that is alive today is a machine that has been working nonstop for four billion years. Um, they our cells have obviously diversified a lot in those four billion years, um, but considering how sloppy biology is, it's even more amazing that these cells have kept working for four billion years. 
course, a lot have died, and we don't see them around anymore. Um, one other big thing that I wanted to, especially in this last unit, think about is that interpretations change, and debate is one of the things that drives science. So whether it's the alpha or the beta gamma subunits that bind is interesting. How noggin works is interesting. But to me, the, fact, the, the ways we discover these things are quite amazing to learn about. And sort of along those lines, any particular experiment is going to have some limitations to it. <coughs> But data really lasts forever. And so if I go into the lab and get a frog with two notochords, it will still get two heads today, just as well as it did in 1929. <coughs> if I do some sloppy purification of alpha subunits, I can still get current through potassium channels, just like Lutz Blumbrommer did in 1988. Um, and so the solutions to the debates in science come from new data and not just from complaints about limitations of existing research. So anyway, thank you all. Um, turn in your things from today, and I will see you all at 7.30.